Welcome to, my name is Steve Elsie. I'm with KIO and CBS Television here uh, locally, and welcome to Whale Fest Monterey 2018. This is our seventh, and we're just so delighted, and thank you so much for coming out. You've given up this gorgeous day to come in and, 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 and visit with us, and, and, and in here, of course, here's some incredible speakers, and, and we're leading up to that right now. Uh, Greg Caillé is our next speaker. He is a professor emeritus at, uh, of, is it ichthyology? Yes. Ichthyology uh, at, at the um, Moss Landing Marine Labs and um, Cal State Fresno. He is a director emeritus of the Pacific Shark, of Pacific Shark Research? Center. See, I was missing the center. That didn't make sense to me. A Pacific Shark, you do all the research. So Pacific uh, Shark Research Center. And, um, and hopefully he'll forgive me for this terrible introduction. But please, a warm welcome for Greg Caillé. Hello, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. You have to... Um, realize I'm looking at a spotlight, so I'm going to work on it, and I'm not going to be able to point at things in my slides, so I'll do my best with uh, the mouse if I have to. What I'm going to talk about today is the diversity and habitats of fishes and other marine organisms in Monterey Bay, the idea being that habitats are important, so that's why the habitats are us is up there, and it's about below Pacific t tides, because I'm also at the bottom, you'll notice the president now of the Canary Row Foundation Board which celebrates the history of Ed Ricketts and John Steinbeck. And of course, Ed Ricketts wrote the book Between Pacific Tides about the organisms that live um, in the t intertidal area. So my talk today is going to be mostly on things that live below the tides. My background's pretty complex up there, but it's fast. I was born and raised in Santa Monica, California, always interested in the ocean, was a surfer. I went to UC Santa Barbara, got both of my degrees there been on the faculty at Moss Landing since 1972. I've had over 122 master's student, students and, a, and about a dozen PhDs on other institutions. But this whole thing today is based on years, decades of sampling and doing research and surveying organisms in all habitats in Monterey Bay, some with research projects, some with just classes. So I know a lot about their org the organisms, their adaptations, and how the assemblages or communities are put together. This is important in Monterey because there's a lot of cultural aspects as well. Monterey Bay has a long, rich cultural history, not just including marine, marine science and marine biology, although it does, but also fisheries, abalone, squids, sardines, and other marine organisms, both fishes and invertebrates. And I need you to think again about Canary Row and the scientist Ed Ricketts, Between Pacific Tides, and the author John Steinbeck, who wrote several books about people in the area, or at least books that were fictionalized, but actually were based on some people in the area. A lot of water sports go on here. And so this will be a Ricketts-like talk, but concentrating on below Pacific rather than between Pacific tides. Look at the line at the bottom. Remember, diversity, that means how many species, how rich the communities are, and habitat-specific assemblages. Remember that I said habitats are us on the first slide. That'll come clear. What's so special about the greater Monterey Bay area? There are over 50 marine science institutions now, close to, if not exceeding, 3,000 marine and coastal scientists, lots of diverse habitats. The only thing I think we're missing are coral reefs and mangrove swamps. A lot of latitudes, longitudes, depths, times, uh, daily, seasonal, and decadal um, dimensions with lots of research vessels going out and doing surveys. Um, this next slide is from the National Marine Sanctuary. You can't read it, that's not the point, but you can tell from it that those dots, those circles with all the numbers in them, over 50 of them, are marine science or marine science related institutions in the greater Monterey Bay area. We have a lot going on here, and it's mainly because of the diversity of habitats and the organisms that live within them. One of these is mine, where I used to work, Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, that's a picture of it in 1965 in the upper left hand corner. And then in the lower right-hand corner, 1974. The first class was in 1966. 
nine students. The director was John Harville. The faculty member was Jim Nybachen. And there were, nine, uh, there were um, nine students at that time, one of whom was Nancy Packard Burnett. That was kind of cool. She's a good friend. Um, we've now had a total of 650 plus master students graduate. In 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake destroyed the original labs. We moved to Salinas into those trailers you can see in the upper right hand side. And the lower left hand side is the, not lower, but upper left hand side is the building after the earthquake, which was a very depressing sight for me to see because we were right there on the beach. And now we're up on the hill and that's a picture of it in the lower left looking north. It's a beautiful facility. We have our open house in April. Um, look it up in the, in the news, please come by. I'm also involved with the Monterey Peninsula Yacht Club, do a lot of sailing, and now I'm doing a lot of cruising and there's a picture of us on a friend's boat um, with a couple of humpback whales right in front of us, um, captured by Kate Spencer of uh, Ocean Safaris, fastraft.com. Beautiful place, wonderful place to go out in the water. And then finally, the Cannery Row Foundation. I just took over this job. Um, the predecessor was Michael Hemp, who wrote the Cannery Row history book on the left. There's an aerial photo of it, a picture of Ed Ricketts' lab, Pacific Biological Laboratories, Ed with a, uh, a giant squid, and uh, the statue of him at the site where he passed away with a train um, accident. Here's the slide that sets the scene. All of us see beautiful scenery like this. You can see it just outside the windows in this theater. You can see it from the wharf. You see sailboats. You see sandy beaches. You see rocky intertidal. You see surf. You see all these things. But what you don't always think about is what's beneath all that. That's what I'm going to get into right now. The outline is this, and the first three topics I'm going to briefly go through because there are seven major habitats in Monterey Bay, marine habitats. The first three are intertidal. Those are the kinds that Ed Ricketts covered. Sandy beach and surf zone, bays and estuaries, rocky intertidal. But there's also rocky subtidal, including kelp forests, deep reefs and banks, soft bottom habitats, which some of us call demersal or benthic habitats, near to offshore, near shore, shelf, slope, or abyss. And then there's a water column. If you're out in the bay a little farther, straight down. So I'm gonna cover those habitats, most of the fish types that are there, and give you an introduction. So I have two ways of introducing you to this subject. One is a cross section. Lower left is, a, uh, a de is designed to show shallow in the upper right going down to deeper, pointing out that there are fishes that live in, this, in the oceans down to as deep as 8,000 meters, and that's about 26,000 feet. Um, and, and even higher, up to 5,200 uh, 5, meters in elevation, ranging from Arctic ice to desert hot springs, hypersaline, al alkaline, anoxic, it's one of the, and the highest diversity is in the tropics. We have pretty high diversity here, even though we're in a temperate region. So you see on the right, 11 of those habitats, I grouped them into seven before, and the numbers on the left show where they are. So for example, estuaries and sloughs would be number one and two, sandy beaches, Rocky intertidal and subtidal would be in green, number three and four. Nearshore benthic, submarine canyon, deep benthic would be five, six, and seven. The black um, ellipse that's uh, encircling it. And then the abysso benthic way offshore, where the really deep water is. And then finally in blue, the meso, epi, and bathypelagic regions uh, of the ocean. We have all those here in Monterey Bay. If you look at a map of Monterey Bay, north, south, east, and west, the lab, Moss Landing Marine Labs, is right here where the, t the arrow is for one and two. One and two would be the estuaries and sloughs, Elkhorn Slough, Sandy Beaches. Number three and four, um, three, three and four on the lower left would be the rocky intertidal. And in the upper middle, 4A would be deeper water or uh, subtidal kelp reefs, not kelp in that case, but subtidal reefs. And then five, six, and seven would be submarine canyon. Um, eight, nine, and 10 would be the water column, and 11 would be the d really deep bottom. As you can see from our lab, which I pointed out a while ago, right here, we can be at the lab at seven in the morning, take our research vessel in about an hour and a half, be in 1,000 to 2,000 meters of water, have a net down there to collect organisms, or if you're Mabari, have a, an ROV, remotely operated vehicle to cover it. And we can show our students and study our, uh, the processes of these habitats and all the organisms that live in them. It's pretty fabulous. Okay, so I'm gonna feature this, environmental features of these habitats, 
how we sample, observe, or survey the fishes and organisms in them, what types of fishes and organisms are there, their diversity and some of their adaptations, and the, the, the telltale story is habitat specificity. The types of fishes and other organisms isms that are there are very predictable by the habitat you're studying, and they're very diverse. At the bottom, you'll notice, don't be shy, there's going to be a quiz at the end. First of all, here's a general picture showing in the upper left-hand corner the marine algae and plants that occupy the habitat. The marine invertebrates are shown by a, a, a circle or a pie diagram, including various things like echinoderms, sponges, corals, um, um, brachiopods, trilobites, too many to mention, but I'll get through them. Um, I just had crab cakes and some, some calamari for lunch today. That, that's this area right in the middle, right here and here, okay? On the upper right is seabirds and shorebirds, very rich diversity there. And on the lower right, sea turtles and marine mammals. And that's appropriate because this is whale fest and that's where they fit. But I'm a fish guy, so sorry, you're gonna hear about fish, fishes mostly today. Fishes, the word fishes means more than one species. The word fish means as many as you want, but it's only one species. There's a pie diagram showing that of the 25,000 plus or minus living species are known, 100 of them are uh, hagfish or lampreys, jawless fishes, agnaths. Almost 1,200 are chondrichthians, sharks, rays, skates, and chimeras. And the rest of them, almost 24,000, are bony fishes. About 58 or 60% of those live in salt water. So we're going to just talk about salt water today. Most of my slides come from this fabulous book by Larry Allen, Dan Pondella, and Michael Horn, the University of California Press, The Ecology of Marine Fishes of California and Adjacent Waters. It's a fabulous book, it's really cheap, and if you need to have a book with all this information in them, you can find a lot of it there. Okay, this is a little tricky. This is an ecological analysis. These are clusters. So you do what you do is you take a list of the species that you find in surveys at each of the habitats list uh, shown all up and down here, and you take those species and you do uh, uh, an analysis that says, they're similar or dissimilar. How similar, how dissimilar. And you run them through a computer program. And what it does is it gives you clusters. We call this cluster analysis. And so when you do that, here's what happens. All the surf zone and bay estuary fishes cluster together. They're similar in species taxonomy. The green, rocky intertidal and subtidal cluster together. The mid-depth rocky reef and deep rocky reef cluster together. The inner shelf, middle shelf, outer shelf, and then the shallow slope, deep slope, and deep bank. Again, all of these we have in Monterey Bay cluster in black, and then all the water column in blue cluster in two different clusters, the coastal and the offshore pelagic. So what I'm telling you is that the species tells you what habitat you're in. The other way to do it is, if you ask me about a habitat, I'll tell you what fishes are likely to be caught there or to be seen there. It's pretty fabulous. Another way to say that is, it's the habitat stupid. But I wouldn't do that with a crowd like you. I don't think you're that way. I think you're just here to have fun and learn. So I've got these diagrams from Larry Allen et al.'s book, showing in the upper left um, the, sh the shallow and terrestrial. And the red is B and E is bay and estuaries. S and Z is uh, surf zone. And RIT is rocky intertidal. And then as you can see, you can go down in the water column or down on the bottom. So I'm going to use this for each of the habitats. There's a picture, and I'm not spending a lot of time on the inner tidal, but there's a surf zone picture ranging from pipefish down here in drift seaweeds to surf perches, more surf perches, top smelt, jack smelt, surf perches, surf smelt, and flat fishes in the shallow waters. So you can see that's a typical assemblage of fish from that habitat. And when you do the clusters, you can see that they come out, there's two of them there, two colors there, black and red. That's a multivariate analysis that shows that the black ones are soft bottom or near shore, and the red ones are surf zone and bay and estuary. So the species that you see pictured in these, each of these little rectangles are the clusters shown diagrammatically. They're predictable. The habitats predict what species you get. There are other organisms that are predictable as well, ranging from shore crabs, um, sand crabs, beach hoppers, polychaete worms, sand dollars, pismoclams, and of course shorebirds. 
The bays and estuaries, those are the 16 in California and the, thir and the three more in Baja California along our coast. Our area is circled in, or encircled in red, shows the different bays and estuaries. We're not covering that either because Ricketts covered a lot of that in his book. But as you can see, there's five types of bays and estuary habitats or um, organisms that inhabit those habitats. Anadromous, meaning they're both fresh and saltwater. Freshwater, meaning they're mostly freshwater. Estuarine, meaning they're mostly in bays and estuaries. Marine, meaning they're mostly offshore, uh, but they're migrants can come in as well. So there's five different lifestyles, you might say. Other organisms that live in bays and estuaries include um, shorebirds, egrets, clams and mussels, sea otters, harbor seals, oysters, and all sorts of little invertebrates like amphipods, isopods, worms, shrimp, gastropods, and crabs. There's a picture of one of my early classes doing tide pool sampling of fishes at Sober on East Point down the Big Sur coast. And there's a typical assemblage of the rocky intertidal fishes you see kelp fishes, gunnels, sculpins, and the like. But we're not covering those because those are in, inside the tide zone. But there's southern, and there's California, and there's north central, so they vary by latitude as well. Other rocky intertidal organisms, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with these, ranging from mussels to, to barnacles uh, to all the invertebrates in the lower left hand. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. In the lower left hand side here, and then here's a cross section, just showing the kinds of rocky intertidal organisms that are there. They have a habitat on which to attach the rocks. And so these things are mostly uh, that way. Now, we're going to go deeper. Rocky subtitle and kelp forest habitats over there under RST, shown as getting deeper, having more habitat um, um, diversity, including rock and outcrops, as well as living biotic habitat like kelp. Here's a long list, but the whole point here is that the rocky subtitle has less wave action than a rocky intertidal, less tidal influences, lower changes in temperature, but they have a hard substrate good for plant like kelp uh, attachment, high spatial heterogeneity, high and consistent food availability, typically high water quality, and competition and predation are likely really important because the habitat is limited. We sample them with hook and line, snorkeling, dip nets, scuba diving, gill nets, um, usually at daytime, sometimes at nighttime now, and now underwater cameras and submersibles have improved these surveys. The fish composition uh, taxonomically is high diversity, relatively high biomass, meaning their weight or volume. And the common fish families are sculpins, kelp fishes, blennies, gobies, greenlings, rock fishes, surf perches, chubs, and wrasses. They're both small and large. They have scales, which means they, they're protected from the rocky substrate. They have a well-developed swim bladder, allowing them to have neutral buoyancy, well-developed lateral line to be able to detect movements and sounds of water going through the water column, well-developed eyes because it's well-lit day and night, and they can see their prey and predators, body shapes variable because they have to handle all this, the problems of that habitat. Fin positions are primarily, the pelvic fins are forward so they can maneuver, and they have large pectoral fins which also help with locomotion, and they're often cryptically colored. Here's a kelp um, forest cross-section showing the canopy and the surface that you're all used to, but there's also the kelp stipe, and then there's also the kelp holdfast, and there are various species that live in those zones, including the zone, I can't get this mouse to work, including the zone in the middle. So that's a cross-section from an old paper. There are at least three categories of kelp bed and rocky reef fishes. There's the conspicuous ones that you see that are large, like Garibaldi and sheephead and rock fishes and so on. There are the cryptic ones that are hard to see that are usually in crevices. And then there are those that are associated with other parts of the kelp or rock habitat. So we know that for a fact in, in those habitats. And in the lower left and lower right, you'll see a typical assemblage of southern rocky subtidal fishes and northern rocky subtidal fishes. They're also <coughs> attributed to ecological habitats so that juveniles are often associated with various parts of them. That's the upper, the upper square or rectangle. And that the species that you see vary from south to north and then there's the macrophyte, which means large plant. Sorry, I did it again. Um, organisms that are associated with um, 
different structures and also once again from north to south. So you get a feeling for what the fishes look like in the kelp forests off this coastline. Other rocky subtidal organisms are very diverse and you're very aware of, of sea otters, but there's also lots of gastropod mollusks and, and nudibranchs and all sorts of things in the food web of the rocky subtidal. Now in Monterey Bay, you can also go off shore to deep rocky reefs. That's the, the round ellipsoid on the lower left, showing the different habitats that go below Pacific tides. Sampling them is more difficult. You need usually a vessel and a sub submersible, remotely operated vehicles like the Ventana or Tiburon operated by Mabari, or camera sleds, which has been used recently by some folks at CSUMB and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And the common fish families that you see on these rocky reefs range from hagfishes, cat sharks, dogfish, chimeras, to lingcod, rockfishes, and then when you get into deeper water, thorny heads, sablefish, hake, rat tails, and flatfishes. There are some pictures of those assemblages from Larry Allen's book, uh, the, the chapter by Milton Love and Mary Yaklovich, showing the mid-depth -rock, rock habitat in the upper left-hand corner, 30 to 100 meters, the deep rock habitat from 100 to 200 meters, and then the deep bank in the lower middle. So you can see the assemblages of fishes vary with depth offshore in the rocky habitats as well. Other marine organisms include wolf eels, crabs, soft corals, um, sea stars, urchins, and other associated organisms. In the soft bottom, demersal, demersal is the word used, or benthic, for the actual bottom, the soft bottom, circled in black there. There's the intermediate shelf, deeper slope, and abyssal depths shown there. And there's the deeper ones. These, char these habitats characteristically have um, low exposure to waves, low tidal influence, little variation in temperature. The, the, the deeper you go, the colder it is. Soft substrate, deeper and finer, sort of sediment to silt. No plants, little invertebrate attachment, but they occupy this, the, the in, uh, in, inter, interstitial um, sand grains. Low spatial heterogeneity, medium food availability, because a lot of food drops down onto the sea floor. Um, and inshore, it's mostly infaunal clams, crustaceans, and pelagic organisms that uh, drop. Offshore, it's similar, but more infaunal worms and some pelagics. High oxygen, often turbid, variable water clarity, probably not a lot of competition for space because there's a lot of sandy mud bottom off this coast. Um, and predation is likely low, uh, and many of the organisms are um, cryptically colored so that predators can't see them. You collect these fishes with otter and beam trawls, some hook and line, some other kinds of trawls, gill nets. The diversity is higher inshore, shallower off, uh, shallower than offshore and deeper. The biomass is relatively high. You get big flatfish, you get big rockfish individually. And the deeper you go, the less the biomass is. And evenness, which means how many different species and how many are dominant versus not dominant, it's low inshore um, with evenness, the an or organisms being dominated by sand dabs and midshipmen. And offshore, it's much higher with many more species and very few species dominating. Okay, I'm going back to the cluster. I think you remember what I did before. This area that we're talking about right now is here. The inner shelf, middle shelf, outer shelf. The species tell you that the assemblages are similar uh, between and among those three shelf habitats and those three slope habitats. So the species are telling you what those habitats are. And the flip side, again, is if you know those habitats, you can actually predict what species of flatfish, rockfish, etc. you'll find as you go deeper and deeper in soft bottom offshore. Lots of species. The diversity here is incredibly high. There are 10 orders of fishes. I don't know how many of you know what an order is, but you start with phylum, class, order, family. So there's 10 orders of fishes here. That's more than any of the habitats we've talked about. Ranging from hagfishes, sharks, and rays, through the eels, cods and codlings, racktails, cusk eels, toadfishes, poachers, combfishes, rockfishes, and thorny heads, sablefish, surf perches, eel pouts, snailfishes, and flatfishes. It's a pretty cool 
group of organism, at least to me, because I really like fish. And that's what they look like. Here's the inner shelf, and there are four clusters that came out of Alan's analysis. The Northern California, no cal, the Central California, the Southern California and Northern Baja, and the Southern Baja habitats. And you'll see an assortment, I'm not gonna be able to go through them in, in detail, but skates like that one, flat fishes like sand dab, sand sole, and so on, and in this case is a lingcod. And then more flat fishes down here, more skates and rays here, and ditto. So in other words, you'll see groups of fishes that are similar in all four of those habitats, north to south, but the species that occupy the families and orders differ from the north to the south. So we call those guilds. A guild is a group of fishes that does the same thing. So within the surf perches or within the flat fishes, you'll have a guild that includes a certain group of species in the north that's got the same type of fishes but different species in the south. So that's a diagram that reflects that. Then there's the middle shelf as you go offshore. Everything I just said, backing up for the inner shelf, is true for the middle shelf, except now you have the same suite of fishes, same guilds of fishes, <coughs> north to south, but different species north to south, as well as inner to middle shelf. And you might expect that when we go to the outer shelf, you might see the same thing, and you do. If somebody gave me a bucket of fishes from Central California, I could tell you with about 80 to 90% certainty what depth it came from. And it would be a different depth in the south than it would be farther north than here, because depth-specific ch changes in species are really pretty common. But you can see there's skates and rays, there's sharks, there's flatfishes, and there's rockfishes um, in those habitats too. So the take-home message is the species assemblage in the soft bottoms offshore vary from north to south and from inner to outer locations, from shallower water to deeper water. And then as you go even farther offshore, the upper slope, you can characterize these in only two categories, California and Northern Baja and Southern Baja. In other words, the species diversity, the f deeper you go, is lower, and apparently those species move a little more in that deep habitat and are more similar to each other latitudinally, north and south, because they're in really deep, cold, high-pressure water. Again, the gills are made up of, of, I'll start down here, flat fishes, and there's a few various snailfish kind of things, cusk eels, rock fishes, rat tails, chimeras, uh, 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 the split nose rockfish, Pacific hake, sablefish. Those are typical deep water fishes that occur in all those latitudes from Northern California down to Baja. And then in Baja, the diversity declines, but the species differ there too. Other organisms include polychaete worms, crustaceans, which include amphipods, cumaceans, tenodeids, isopods, crabs, shrimps, stomatopods, that's one of my wife's favorite words, nudibranchs and stomatopods, she loves those, um, echinoderms and mollusks. As you can see, I'm not, he I'm not dealing heavily with the invertebrates. I've, I've studied them and played with them a lot, but my, my focus is fishes. That's, that's my fun stuff. And then finally, the farthest offshore is what we call bathil, which includes some of the same ones you saw uh, earlier, the sablefish, the, the cat sharks, flat nose, rat tails, grenadiers, thorny heads, black hagfish, giant grenadiers, eel pouts, the deep sea sole, and then when you get into the abyss, more grenadiers and skates and snailfishes. So the, the species groups are even different the farther offshore you go. We did a little work on the Davidson Seamount in the lower right of this uh, habitat, probably 60 miles to the southwest of Monterey and Moss Landing, and we saw a lot of these really cool animals. My favorite is the sea toad, Chonicops, which used to be Bathychonex coloratus. It's a little bitty grapefruit-sized anglerfish that sits there. Um, but we've, we saw bathosaurs in the middle right, upper, the halosaur in the middle. We saw the grenadiers. And my other favorite fish, which is probably the ugliest fish most of you have ever experienced, 
the blob sculpin, of which there may be 30 or 40 specimens known to man. It was named in 1979 as that relative rare. Okay, and then there's some invertebrates of the Davison Seamount, including soft corals in the upper left, sea anemones, and spot prawns, which you may have eaten. They're delicious and is a great fishery for those in Monterey Bay. Bamboo coral, which we've done some aging growth work on. Um, octopus, the serrate octopus, and the Venus flytrap, sea anemone. It's a fabulous habitat. It's part of the National Marine Sanctuary. It's a series of contiguous volcanoes that are underwater and I believe have always been underwater. And that the habitat diversity there is quite phenomenal. Okay, now we'll go to the last part of the ocean. How am I doing on time? Not too bad, we got plenty. Now we're gonna go to the water column, all the blue stuff. So you look in this diagram and you go over here and there's the epipelagic. Epi means at the surface of the pelagic. Pelagic means the water offshore that doesn't have any continuity with land on, in terms of being close to shore. Oops, wait a minute. Okay, and so I'm gonna go through these one at a time. That's the epipelagic the surface uh, habitat in the open ocean. Lots of volume of water there, lots of surface area. This is most of the ocean, to be honest with you. Um, relatively homogeneous, it's water, okay? Relatively small changes in temperature and salinity, at least in one location, except seasonally you see some changes. The clarity is usually high. There's hardly any substrate except floating things like flotsam and jetsam, um, and phytoplankton, little bitty, primary producers in the water. Low food availability, competition is probably low, predation is probably pretty high because whatever you are, you're prey for something else who's swimming quite rapidly to find food. That's the kind of habitat that is. You collect with hook and line, large midwater crawls, drift gill nets, purse seines, and using hydroacoustics. The water column fish fauna is relatively div uh, low diversity relatively low biomass. There's a lot more water than there are fishes or invertebrate organisms in that water column. And the common fish families that are commonly called pelagic wet fish because they're taken in groups that are in nets that bring up lots of wet fishes, anchovies, sardines, bigger fishes like tunas, jacks, dolphin fishes in the tropics, billfishes, mackerel, and the sharks, blue thresher basking sharks. Their adaptations are that these fishes are mostly large. They're adapted for swimming and for floating, buoyancy. They're streamlined for fast, fast swimming. The lateral heat retention mechanism that lets their muscles be warm so that they can swim more efficiently, reduce scales, and not very well developed swim bladder. They swim to stay afloat. They don't necessarily hover. Their sensory mechanisms are well developed, both lateral line and eyes and they have poorly developed ear bones or otoliths, which are mainly for balance and hearing. Well-developed feeding, because they are eating machines. Countershading color, counter coloration for prey being able, uh, prey avoidance so that, the, the, I'm not saying that right, so that the predators have countershading so that the prey can't see them as well, so they're dark on the top and silvery on the bottom for, for the prey that are looking up or down to stay away from them. The fast growth, very fast growing fishes, broadcast spawners, open ocean kind of um, reproduction. They develop large larvae and competition we have no idea about, but predation is very high in the open ocean. This is a picture that I won't spend much time on, but it's um, a series of murals that Ray Troll and his colleagues did on the former NOAA Nymphs National Marine Fishery Service building in Pacific Grove. I don't know what's gonna happen to that, but it's a piece of work, and if you go around it and look at it, it takes you through the epipelagic organisms that occupy the California Current and Monterey Bay from season to season. It's really cool. I strongly encourage you to go take a look at it on a nice sunny day. They're divided into several funny names, xenoepipelagic, which means coastal. And that includes the anchovies, the pompano, the sardine, the mackerels, the bonita, barracuda, and yellowtail. There's another group called the holo epipelagic, meaning they're active swimmers that are always in the upper water column, upper a few hundred meters, including flying fish in the south, sowry in central California, blue shark, salmon shark, basking shark, big eye thresher shark, and the tunas, and some of the jacks, and at the lower left, luvar, the lower right, striped marlin in tropical areas, 
And of course, we can't forget our friend, the ocean sunfish, mola mola. Most of you see those every summer around here. <clears throat> there are some deeper active swimmers that are also holoepipelagic, always in the water column, including the beautiful opa, the king of the salmon, the oarfish, and highbrow crestfish. All of those are extremely beautiful blues and reds in their colorations. Not real common, but we see them. But then there's also palm frets, escalar, oilfish, snake mackerels, long-nosed lancetfish, and ragfish in that habitat. I think you're getting the feeling that the diversity of fishes off this coast is pretty high. Yes, it is. Then there's this funny word, brepho-epipelagic, which I have never understood. But if you go to the lower legend, it's the coastal adults that have large pelagic juvenile stages. So for example, the upper picture is a striped mullet. They're normally estuarine species, but their offspring go in the water column offshore. Lingcod, the same way. Cabazon, which is a sculpin, the tide pool blennies, Boccaccio, long spine thorny head, and also the Dover sole. So these are fishes that adults live in one location, but their juveniles live in the brepho epipelagic habitat. That's not going to be in the quiz. I, if I can't remember what it means, you don't have to. Oh, what happened? Richard, I don't know what happened. Oh, oh, it, it was dozing? Is that what it was doing? Okay, anyway, there we are. Back to the brepho epiplasia. I think the problem was I said the word quiz again, and it even scared the laptop. Nothing showing. Okay, I'll go back to brepho epipelagic. Say that word five times. It looked like the computer must have gone to sleep. Is that what happened? Okay, back. Okay, here we go. Next slide. Other epipelagic organisms include squid, whales, dolphins, sea turtles, seabirds, and of course we have to mention them now because this is whale fest, and I will give you that. Okay. Now, now we're going to go deeper. The meso, bathy, bathy, and benthopelagic habitats in the water column, not on the bottom. One would think you look down there and there's nothing going to be there. Well, there isn't a lot there, but there is something. One little story about the Monterey Submarine Canyon. Um, it, it's in the middle of Monterey Bay. You can see it here. It starts at Moss Landing, comes out, meanders down, goes in here to Carmel Bay, down to Monastery Beach, and then it goes even farther down where the arrow is going past the, the blue ellipsoid. It goes down to, I think, 3,600 meters. It really depends where you stop it. It just goes down to the abyssal plain. It's comparable in size to the Grand Canyon, the greater Monterey Bay Canyon system is, and that in con consists of Monterey, Soquel, and Carmel Canyons. All of you have heard of that or should have heard about it, and if you haven't, I'll, I can tell you about it later. It is a suitable habitat. We're talking about the water column above it now, though, and a lot of people think, well, that must have been formed when Elkhorn Slough was a river and there was erosion down from a river mouth into it. It turns out, no. The two plates on this coast, the Pacific plate's been moving north and the continental plate has been staying where it is. So it's probably a remnant of the old Colorado River down near Southern California eight to 10, maybe more millions of years ago. Now, I'm not a geologist and I don't think in those time frames very much but I got that from Gary Green, who was our former geological oceanographer and director at Moss Landing. If anybody's interested in references, I can, I can provide those. So the canyon's here temporarily, but in our lifetime, it'll be here the whole time. The deep water column, high volume, the really highest volume of the water in the world, stratified from surface to deep in terms of lower light, lower temperatures, increased pressure, food reduction, salinity increasing, water clarity pretty high, but no substrate, it's just water. And it gets colder, darker, and saltier the deeper you go. You collect it, the first collections were basically from predators' stomachs being caught by fishermen and regurgitating on the deck. And we said, oh, look at these cool fish this thing just regurgitated. Nobody had ever seen them before because the fish was doing the sampling. But we now use large midwater crawls, hydroacoustics, and of course, the more politically correct 
human-occupied submersibles that used to be called man-occupied or whatever, and the remotely operated vehicles. And that's what's going on now, and that's where the pioneers of the world are going. The top of composition, the diversity is relatively low. Biomass is extremely low. It's very for poor food. And you've got fishes in here. This habitat has a totally different fauna than any of the other ones I've talked about. Deep water sharks, eels, bristle mouths, hatchet fishes, deep sea smelts, barrel eyes, cool fish, dragon and viper fishes, lantern fishes, fang tooth, big scales, angler fishes, eel pouts. I'm going to show you a few, but I've got to hustle here because I have about four minutes. They're mostly small. They're mostly flimsy, lethargic, with reduced um, structural components like bones, many without a swim bladder. They have very well-developed lateral lines and poorly developed eyes uh, that often have extreme adaptations like scotopic and tubular adaptations. Poorly developed ot otoliths or ear bones, well-developed feeding adaptations, large jaws, big teeth. They produce light. Bioluminescence is now in this habitat new to you. We haven't seen it in any other habitat much before. They grow pretty fast, but only in length and not in bulk because there's hardly any food. They grow as big as they can, as fast as they can, which is often maybe eight inches, nine inches in their life, just so that they can't be eaten by something else that they're going to encounter. They're broadcast spawners. Some of them are brooders. Hardly any competition, but probably predation is very high. So here's the run-through of these fishes. These are eel-like fishes, the eel pouts, the snipe eels, the gulper eel, like on the upper right-hand corner. Lower right shows you that Mabari's symbol is a gulper eel. And when they first used that, no one had ever caught a gulper eel in Monterey Bay before. But now they have. And now they have video of them live. So they're here. But these fishes are just not that common. There's barracudina, black smelt, tube shoulders. There's bristle mouths and hatchet fishes. These have photophores on the ventral region and large eyes that are looking up. There's this fish, the barrel eye, which has eyes in a tubular structure and photophores, light organs. Pretty cool stuff. Bruce Robeson and Kim Rice and Bickler studied these live um, using their ROV. We have viper fish, dragon fish, snaggle tooths, loose jaws, black dragons. We've got far red bioluminescence. As you can see, that green and red uh, photophore on the, the head of this Aristostomia sinilans. That's courtesy of Steve Haddock, one of the scientists at Mabari. Light organs. These are lanternfish, all of which have light organs. These are big scales that don't have them, but they have, in the case of the dreamer or the anglerfish, they have lures. And then there's all sorts of other organisms in the water column. Jellies, tenophores, amphipods, prawns, um, squid, octopus, pteropods, and so on. The Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary has the Simon Sanctuary Integrated Monitoring, Net Monitoring Network going on, and you can go to that site and see these, the, the species that live in all these habitats on some of their research uh, survey data points. So I hope I've convinced you that fishes and marine organism assemblages are predictable by marine habitats in Monterey Bay. And not just, inter in, not just between Pacific tides, but below Pacific tides. And now for the quiz. You didn't believe me. I'm almost done. Don't worry. What did we learn about fishes and other organisms? High diversity and habitat-specific assemblages. So you can predict what you see in a habitat um, in terms of the species by knowing the habitat. You can predict what habitat you've sampled by looking at the species. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Um, I, I'm told that I can uh, answer a few questions. And if, if, if I don't see you, it's because of the spotlight in my face. Anybody have a question? Yes? A, gen, a, a general statement about lifespan would be the deeper that you go, the longer lived the fishes are. We've gotten yellow eye rockfish validated with bomb radiocarbon and radioisotope ratios down to 125 years old. Deep sea corals are thought to be in the hundreds of years. That would not be true for shallow water things. 
Um, it also is related to size. So if you're talking about lanternfish and bristle mouths, they're not gonna live very long. But if you're talking about sablefish or deep water rockfish or large bodied organisms, they tend to live longer. Does that answer your question? Good, good to see you. Anything else? Well, a lot of the drawing type things are from Larry Allen, Dan Pondella, and Michael Horn's book, okay. The Ecology of California Marine Fishes. A lot of the, 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 like the one from Steve Haddock, that's on the Mabari website. And you can go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute website and take a look at incredible videos. It's all open. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. you bet. Another question. Right. In some habitats, there are seasonal changes in species uh, composition. For example, the upper water column, you get tropical things here in the summertime that you wouldn't get in the wintertime. In deep water, absolutely not. There's no evidence of season, except that the the food falls can differ. So right after a really busy upwelling season, lots of productivity, you'll get seagrasses and debris settling out, and there have been detected seasons of food availability on the seafloor. But the fishes that are there to use that don't change. So that, that's a, a quick, quick answer to your question about seasonal assemblages. Okay, thank you.